It's a disturbing practice throughout much of human history. Public execution. You've seen the movies, right? I mean, The End of Braveheart, uh, Pirates of the Caribbean, others. Right in the middle of town, with a crowd of people gathered, the criminals are on display, their crimes are read out loud, and then they are brought to the guillotine or the gallows or the stake to be burned. And then the deed is carried out while everyone watches. And this was a fairly common occurrence throughout much of human history. And people would gather from all around for the spectacle. Can you imagine something like that today? Right? And yet as disturbing as this is to consider, we too gathered to carry out our own public execution right here just three weeks ago as we watched our friend Jonathan put to death under the waters inside of this tomb. How appropriate. Several of you have experienced your very own public execution right here in this room. As crowds gathered round and watched. You see, baptism is a kind of public execution, is it not? And it has been a core practice of the church throughout centuries. But more than just the occasional baptism, every week we gather right here with a large cross right in front of us. One of the absolute worst instruments of public execution in history where criminals would be hung for hours or perhaps even days, publicly exposed to the elements as crowds watched until they finally died, often from asphyxiation because their bodies became too weak to keep breathing. This instrument of horror is right here in front of us every week. And every week, when we gather, we receive the bread and the cup as we turn our attention to the execution of Jesus on the cross. And together, we remember and we proclaim his public death together. So the church's historic acts of baptism and communion are essentially acts of public execution. They are acts of death. And these practices of the church are core to forming us in the image of Jesus whose life was marked by incarnation, crucifixion, and resurrection. At the heart of the Jesus-shaped life is a cross-shaped life. So if you have a Bible, go ahead and open up to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10 is where we'll be reading from together. Today we'll begin in verse 32. In just a moment, Mark 10, 32. Uh, A few weeks ago, after reflecting on um, the theme of incarnation earlier this year, we considered together how baptism and communion are incarnational acts that communicate Jesus' presence to us, and call us to be present to one another. Well, today, after for several weeks we've been reflecting on this theme of crucifixion, 
I want to consider how baptism and communion are cruciform acts in which we die with Jesus to sin and self, and we die for each other. So let's read our text, Mark chapter 10, beginning in verse 32. They were on their way up to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way, and the disciples were astonished while those who followed were afraid. And again, he took the twelve aside and told them what was going to happen to him. We are going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you? He asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right hand and the other at your left hand in your glory. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? We can, they answered. And Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. When the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John, and Jesus called them all together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, thank you for the gift of your word and for calling us to follow you. You do not call us anywhere that you yourself have not been. And so help us to faithfully follow you, Lord. God, I ask as we reflect on the words of your scripture together today, that you would sharpen our minds and soften our hearts, that we might know you and love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 It is a frustrating and yet also somewhat comforting thing to see just how utterly clueless Jesus' disciples often are. Right? Again and again, they just seem to miss the point. Uh, Jesus speaks clearly, and yet when it comes to actually listening to him and learning what he shares, they're clueless. It's frustrating to see, but comforting because don't we too? Throughout Mark's narrative, Jesus explains to his disciples three times in detail that his destination is death. He is headed toward death. The Son of Man will be killed, he says, three times plainly. And yet, every single time, they completely miss the point. If you flip back just a couple of pages in chapter 8, verse 31, Jesus tells them the first time, the Son of Man will be killed. And Peter 
right after that, takes Jesus aside and rebukes him. How could you say such a thing? Never, Lord. This will never happen to you. And Jesus responds to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You've missed the point. You didn't hear me. So flipping forward another page or so, in chapter 9, verse 31, Jesus tells them a second time, the Son of Man will be killed. And then Mark tells us, but they did not understand what he meant and were afraid to ask him about it. And not only did they not understand, but they completely dismissed it. Because right after this, the disciples are having an argument with each other about who's greatest, who's most important. Jesus says, I'm about to die. And the next thing that comes, they're saying, hey, I'm going to be the best. No, you're going to be, you know, on and on. They're arguing about this. So Jesus rallies them up and says, what are you guys arguing about? And he sets them straight by saying, anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. And then he draws their attention to a little child who's in their midst. And he says, this is what it is to be in the kingdom of God, like a small child. And then, flipping ahead, another page, we come to our passage in chapter 10. Jesus explains to his disciples a third time that he will be condemned and put to death. And you'd think third time's the charm. They get it this time, right? No, we just read it, didn't we? Once more, the disciples completely miss the point. Instead of hearing this call to die, James and John are still concerned with greatness and glory. They arrogantly ask Jesus, teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Well, what do you want me to do for you? Jesus responds. And then they answer, let one of us sit at your right hand and the other at your left in glory. You see, James and John seem to still be operating under the idea that Jesus is going to Jerusalem in order to take control He's going to overthrow the oppressive rule of the Romans. He is going to set the corrupt religious leaders straight. And he's going to take his seat on the throne as the Messiah, the King of God's people. And the thing is, is actually that is what Jesus is doing. Jesus is going to Jerusalem for all of those things. But the throne that Jesus will be seated on is the cross. His throne is the cross. Jesus reigns not by taking life from others, but by giving his own life for them. So Jesus answers James and John, you don't know what you're asking. They think they're asking Jesus for spots in his ruling council. But actually, what they're asking for are spots next to Jesus on the cross. Jesus says, you don't know what you're asking when you're asking to be at my right and left. And so Jesus continues, and he asks them, can you drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? He uses this word picture of cup and baptism. James and John still have no idea what Jesus is talking about, so they answer confidently, we can. But for everyone who reads and reflects on this story later, the true meaning is clear. Early church fathers reflected on this text. Augustine wrote, he meant, of course, the cup of humility and suffering. John Chrysostom, an incredible preacher from the early church, said, Here Christ was calling his crucifixion a cup and his death a baptism. And from this point on, Jesus himself has linked the practices of baptism and communion to his crucifixion. Drinking the cup, 
And being baptized are ways of joining Jesus in his death. Jesus makes this clear. In verse 39, he speaks not only to James and John, but to all disciples who will follow him and be formed in his image. You will drink the cup that I drink. You will be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. This is just one more way of saying what we've been reflecting on this whole season. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Baptism and communion are ways that we take up our cross, follow Jesus, and join him in death. This is the call for all who seek to follow Jesus. And these are the practices for all of Jesus' followers. So with the rest of our time, I want to simply reflect on how baptism and communion are pictures of dying with Christ. Dying to sin and self, and dying for each other. So let's start with baptism. Baptism, a plunge in the water. From the earliest times of Christian faith, baptism was understood not merely as some sort of initiation ceremony or cleansing practice. It was seen as death. It was seen as an act of dying. Again, John Chrysostom, speaking in the 4th century, described it this way. What the cross and burial were to Christ, baptism is to us. What the cross and burial were to Christ, baptism is to us. Before he said this, the oldest known church building uh, located in Syria dates back to around A.D. 240, uh, right? And, and I mean, you could still go and visit this, uh, potentially. And inside of this oldest church building that we know of, there is a baptistry shaped like a coffin. Shaped like a coffin. The message was clear. This is where we come to die. Baptism is a place of dying, to sin to ourselves with Christ who died for us. And in the very first century, this is how Paul talked about baptism. In Romans 6, he writes, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Baptism is a place where sin and our old self are put to death and we are fundamentally changed. Baptism is a core moment. It's a pivot point in all of life. it's, It's a moment, it's an identity marker that often was referenced and referred back to in the early church. We see this throughout so many of Paul's writings in Scripture. Paul regularly reminds people of their experience of baptism as he tells them and calls them to their life with God. Uh, just a few of them. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, he writes, We were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body. He can just say that because that's an experience they've had. In Galatians chapter 3, he writes, All of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. And again, in Colossians chapter 2, he writes to them, you were buried with him in baptism. Each one of these verses, along with many more, seem to be this refrain 
remember your baptism. Remember your baptism. This is not just some initiation ceremony that you did and then forget about. It's not just some way of marking a moment in life. It's a pivotal moment. It's a death that you died with Christ. Remember your baptism. This is not something that we have typically done well. Baptism isn't something we tend to think about as life-altering and identity-marking. I mean, just think about it. When you ask someone, hey, who are you? You might learn their name, their employment, their marriage status, their hobbies, right? I'm Drew. I'm a minister. I'm married. Since I was eight years old, I've been a musician. I still like playing music, right? These are some of the things you might learn if you ask me who I am. You can fill in the prompts with your own, right? Who are you? But how often, when thinking about who we are, do we even think to consider, I'm baptized? I'm someone who has been baptized. How often does that even come to to mind? Do we even think about it in this way? Because this is precisely how the early church thought about this. It was a core moment of identity. Who are you? I am someone who is baptized. I am someone who has been baptized into Christ. I am someone who has died with him. It's a moment they would remember and recall. It was something that reminded them, this is who you are. When we do think about our baptism, it's often to say just how much we don't remember it. You know, I was so young when that happened, or I've changed so much since then, or I didn't really understand what I was doing. It's led many people to be re-baptized. And some people will come down really hard, either forbidding re-baptism as some kind of a contradiction or insisting on a particular kind of baptism for only the right reasons. Uh, And I don't know that there's a single objective position to take on whether to be re-baptized or not, depending on a person's experience. Uh, For some, being baptized again might be absolutely the right thing to do. Uh, For others, you might need only remember your baptism, because this is who you are. For those who have been baptized, I want you to hear this. When you are tempted by sin, when you're racked with guilt and shame, when you're under the heavy burden of depression and discouragement. Remember, you are baptized. You have been baptized in Christ. You've died to sin. You've died to shame. You've died to all the whims and attempts of the enemy to control your life. You are baptized. That moment might have been a few weeks ago. It might, have been th- might be three years ago. It might be three decades ago. It might be twice that long. You might barely be able to remember it. You might not remember it at all. But that experience of baptism is no less a part of you than your physical birth, which I'm pretty confident you don't remember at all but it's who you are. It's who you are. Baptism is who you are. You were buried in the waters. Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Remember your baptism. And for anyone who's not been baptized, the invitation is here for you. 
Do you want to follow Jesus in the life that he offers? Well, then join him in the death that he died. Be baptized into this death. Baptism is a joining with him in his death. And then there's communion. The Lord's Supper, the bread and the cup. Another act of joining Jesus in his death as we remember and proclaim. The practice of communion is described in 1 Corinthians 11, a passage that we've read together a number of times before. Paul writes, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Every time we come to the table, we remember Jesus' death, and we proclaim Jesus' death to one another and to the world. This constant reminder of Jesus' death on the cross is meant to keep us from making the mistake that James and John made, thinking that our faith might be a source of worldly power and glory, of influence around those in the world, rather than a call to serve and sacrifice as Jesus did. And so every week we are reminded that the way of Jesus leads to the cross, not to our own gain, not to our own power, The way of Jesus leads to the cross. We proclaim his death in communion every week so that we might live his death in our lives every day. We proclaim his death to one another in communion every week so that we might live his death in our lives every day. In this way, communion is not only a picture of Christ's death on the cross, but also a picture of our life in Christ. The spiritual writer Henry Nouwen was once asked by a secular friend of his, why don't you write something about the spiritual life for me and for my friends? that we might understand. And after much thought, Henry Nouwen recalled this description of the Last Supper in the Gospels. After they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And Henry Nouwen wrote, these words summarize my life as a Christian because as a Christian, I am called to become bread for the world. Bread that is taken, blessed, broken, and given. At the Last Supper, Jesus took bread, blessed, broke it, and gave it as his body. And today, we are the body of Christ who are taken, blessed, broken, and given. And we are reminded of this every week as we come to the table. Now, and went on to, to write a chapter on each one of these things in his beautiful book, Life of the Beloved, I highly recommend it. It's an excellent book. 
I will simply say a little bit about each one of these words as we close and as we move toward the table together. And so first, at the table, we remember that we have been taken. We have been chosen by Christ. He sees us, and he knows us. He knows our sins. He knows our unique and often quirky personalities. He knows us, and still he calls, follow me. You have been called by Christ, chosen by him, taken. Then at the table, we remember that we have been blessed by Christ. We are among the poor in spirit, those who mourn, the meek, the hungry and thirsty, calling out for righteousness and justice. We are among all of those people who Jesus calls blessed. We have been given the gift of the Holy Spirit and the promise of Jesus' presence with us as we live with him in his kingdom. You are blessed by Christ. And at the table, we also remember the ways in which we are broken with Christ. We have been broken by sin and by shame, just as Jesus was broken for sin and shame on the cross. And on the cross, Jesus broke the power of sin so that we might be free from it. We bring all our brokenness to the cross so that we might join Jesus there in his death as we die to sin with him. And finally, at the table, we are reminded that we are given by Christ. Jesus' work on the cross is not just for us to store up salvation for ourselves, but rather to offer that salvation to the world. We are taken, blessed, and broken so that we can be given in love and service to the world. Just as Jesus offered his body to the disciples, so now he offers us his body to the world. So at the table, we remember and proclaim the death of Jesus. But we also remember our own death with Jesus. We proclaim his death in communion every week so that we might live his death in our lives every day. So friends, let us remember our death with Christ in baptism. And let us proclaim our death with Christ at the table. Let us hear Jesus' words once more and live them as we die with him. You will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. Amen. Amen.